Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Assembly Committee on Commerce and Labor. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Assemblywoman Carlton. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Here. Assemblywoman Dickman. Here. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Flores. Present. Assemblyman Frierson. Here. Assemblywoman Hardy. Here. Assemblywoman Kasama. Here. Assemblywoman Martinez. Present. Assemblywoman Marzola. Here. Assemblyman O'Neill. Here. Assemblywoman Tolls. Here. Chair Howdigy. Here. Madam Secretary, um, please indicate all committee members present. Welcome everyone tuning in over the internet. Before we start, I would like to make a few housekeeping announcements. Please remember all exhibits, written testimony, and amendments must be submitted by noon on the business day prior to the committee meeting. People who wish to provide testimony or attend the meeting virtually must pre-register online at the legislature's website. The public is strongly encouraged to submit written testimony in advance of the meeting by emailing the Assembly Commerce and Labor at asmcl at asm.state.nv.us. Members, please remember to keep your camera on at all times. This will help us ensure we have a quorum unless you are stepping away from your computer for non-committee related business. Members and presenters, please remember to be muted at all times, unmute yourself to speak, and then promptly mute yourself when you are done. Thank you to everyone, and let's begin with our agenda. We have two bills on our agenda today. I am going to start with Assembly, um, Assembly Bill 177. So I will open the hearing on Assembly Bill 177, and I believe we have our Majority Leader, Assemblywoman Benita Thompson, here to present uh, alongside with her uh, co-presenter, Ms. Bellard. Thank you so much. I'm Assemblywoman Teresa Benitez Thompson. I represent Assembly District 27, and I wanna thank the chairwoman and members of the committee for allowing me to talk with you today about this bill and for presenting this public policy change um, to you for consideration. First, I wanna give you a little bit of history on how we got to now. Why do we need a bill like Assembly Bill 177? Why are prescriptions not available in multiple languages so that people with limited English proficiency can readily know what is in their prescription bottle and how they should take it? In his paper, English is Not Enough, the Language of Food and Drug Labels, Ryan Arai details the history of the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA's English-only policies. In his paper, Arai looks at demographic trends in America, then contrasts it with the FDA's food and drug label requirement that labels be printed in English with no consideration for translation into additional languages. He notes some exceptions to the rule for Spanish-speaking U.S. territories. He also recounts that the FDA did experiment with Spanish language translation requirements for patient package inserts in 1980. Patient package inserts, which are required to accompany a prescription drug, were developed for four reasons. First, to promote the safe and effective use of prescription drugs. Second, to provide patients with the benefit, risk, and directions for use of the prescription drugs. Third, to reduce potential liability for prescription drug manufacturers. And lastly, to reduce the number of overall malpractice actions for physicians. All good things. However, the FDA revoked the requirement for the patient inserts to be printed in Spanish just two years later. Policy has been relatively static ever since. So under the status quo, healthcare facilities receiving fundings from the federal government, including Medicaid and Medicare reimbursements, should provide interpretation and translation services to individuals with limited English proficiency. For example, the 1964 Civil Rights, the Americans with Disability Act, and the Affordable Care Act are federal laws that require hospitals, clinics, and other healthcare institutions 
covered by federal funding to provide language access. However, these are commonly interpreted to mean verbal translation while inside of the clinical setting and have been implemented as such, including in pharmacies. So here's the problem. The problem is that persons with limited English proficiency are systemically prevented from having their prescription labels and patient information printed in a language they can understand, and it's problematic. The composite of our nation is changing to be majority minority nation, and Nevada's demographics reflect that national trend. According to the report, Nevada County Age, Sex, Race, and Hispanic Origin Estimates and Projections 2000 to 2038, estimates from 2000 to 2017, and projections from 2018 to 2038, prepared by Jeff Hardcastle, the Nevada State Demographer with the Nevada Department of Taxation. He states Nevada population right now for the year 2021 is just over 3.1 million people, of which 320,000 are Asian or Pacific Islander, not of Hispanic origin, which is 10% of the total population. 977,000 are Hispanic origin of any race, which is 31% of the population. And the trends are projected to grow by 2038. Nevada's population will grow to just over 3.5 million people, of which nearly half in will be Asian or Pacific Islander, and 1.3 million will be Hispanic. But what do we know about the ability for these populations to have English proficiency? Well, we've got dead data on that too. It doesn't have to be a guessing game. On March 9th, 2000, uh, 2020, the Gwynn Center's Daniel Linden published the 2020 Census in Nevada snapshot number seven. It states, quote, there are 139 census tracts in Clark County, most of them located in Las Vegas, wherein more than 10% of households have no, have no residents over the age of 14 who speak only English or who speak English very well. And at this point, I am going to screenshot a piece of that report for you because I think it's important to see um, what we know about languages in Clark County specifically. So you can see here the table one top languages spoken in Clark County and percentages of speakers of those language who speak English less than very well. Over here of Spanish, we've got 45%. Uh, Vietnamese, 57%. French, 18%. German, 15%. So these are our folks who um, are less than English proficient, say that they are not speaking English very well. And we can see right now that of these populations, they would not be comfortable picking up a label and reading it. These are the folks who would absolutely need language assistance. So data population trends such as these help us to understand the changing face of Nevada. Ideally, these trends are ones that many industries are watching and planning for, including the healthcare sector. Why? Well, first off, it's the right thing to do for patient safety. As part of the literature review and the study, evaluations of language concordant patient-centered drug-labeled instructions, lead author Stacy Cooper Bailey, who's a PhD and has her master's degree in public health, states, quote, Recently, studies among ling language um, English limited English proficient adults have linked prescription misunderstandings to higher rates of drug adverse reactions, unsafe medication management, and poor adherence. Additionally, the Institutes of Medicine reported that poor comprehension of prescription instructions is a root cause of adverse drug events and other medication errors. Second, it makes financial sense for the entire healthcare si system. Adverse drug events are very costly to the medical system, and many of them are preventable. The study identifying hospital-based admissions due to adverse drug events using a computer-based model published by Pharma Epidemiology and Drug Safety found that as many as 28% of adverse drug events are preventable, and severe cases have a trend towards being the most preventable. So I would propose a solution to all of this is a public policy change that is embodied in Assembly Bill 177. It is a surprisingly short bill, but as we all know, short bills can be the ones that cause us the biggest 
um, amount of angst or um, can, can be the ones where we need to give additional consideration for all types of consequences for them. In section one, you're gonna see the requirement that uh, the label, a prescription label, which is the reference you see in line six, NRS 639.281, that that label could be printed in addition to another language than English. So remember, because of the FDA's English policy, you have to have an English label on that bottle. So it would be an English label and then the label that the person's proficient in. Um, you'll see also that in subsection two, we are looking for the pharmacy to publish a notice that the patients can ask for their uh, prescription label to be printed in an additional language, and then those languages listed that they can print in. Um, you see some requirements for the board and the type of um, adoptions that they are going to uh, have to adopt and bring into place. Um, and then you'll see the sub five, and you're gonna hear testimony from those in opposition to sub five, and we're having an ongoing conversation regarding that. I think we're gonna end up in a good place there. Um, two pieces that I wanted to make sure you know that I am uh, going to be working with stakeholders on is on subsection one, line eight, where the requirement is English and any other language Instead, I am looking to conceptually amend this based on demographics within a given area so that that way we don't have an ambiguous print the label in all languages that are known in the world, but rather what is happening um, and within the state or a specific area of the state and then be a little bit more targeted in the languages that are available. Um, uh, and then I told you about section five, where we are looking to, uh, uh, there's a conversation on that. Um, then also that the notice of the patient rights as well, it seems to make the most sense to have the board adopt what that standard language would be. And also using demographic data um, languages that it should be posted in at the pharmacy so people know of their right. But um, lastly, I wanna say uh, that one of the, the biggest reasons why I feel like this public policy ought to be considered, hopefully passed, but really that we should contemplate it as a legislative body is because we know that there are people who once they leave that supportive clinical setting, they go home. They're going home with their medications. And we have so many families that are looking at that bottle and can't read it. And for all of the same reasons that we want any type of healthcare information to be out there, all those reasons that the FDA put patient inserts in place to prevent adverse drug effects, they're useless if you can't read them. They're useless if you have a family sitting in a home trying to Google translate them to how they apply a fentanyl patch or to how they use their morphine bottles. And as a person who has worked in healthcare for the past 10 years, being in a home-based setting, meaning being in people's individual residencies, I've left homes so many times working with families who have limited English proficiency, just really wondering how they were gonna understand to use their prescriptions when you have changing caregivers. You can't just tell one person in one family something and just assume that the onus is gonna be on them or their children or extended family members to translate all of this stuff. It really needs to be medically certified translators who are doing that. and. Um, it's kept me awake a lot at night worrying about those kinds of families. And that's why I appreciate the time to discuss uh, this piece of legislation. And I will um, stop talking now and allow Ms. Ballard to talk. Chair Hadegi, Vice Chair Carlton, and members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify in support of AB 177 today. My name is Kate Ballard, and I'm a registered nurse in Oregon. I was one of the primary advocates for SB 698, a very similar Oregon law that was passed in 2019 and went into effect January 1st, 2021. The Oregon law came about after nursing students working with patients with limited English proficiency or LEP noticed a high rate of medication error among this population. For example, there was a mother from the Middle East who was highly educated and spoke multiple languages, but English wasn't one of them. She couldn't read the labels on her child's inhalers and was unintentionally giving him the wrong inhaler during his acute asthma attacks. 
This child was hospitalized for life-threatening asthma attacks that were unknowingly going untreated. After this bill was introduced to the Oregon legislature, there was an outpouring of support. The common sense legislation resonated with healthcare professionals, community organizations, and private citizens alike. Simply put in one testimony, the only difference between a medicine and a poison is understanding how to use it. I would like to briefly address some of the common questions about prescription translation bills. First is cost. In analyzing the financial impacts of AB 177, it's important to consider the significant cost savings this bill would bring. A large portion of the costs projected by chain pharmacies are front-loaded costs to integrate the translation software into their complex systems. This is marginal compared to the high ongoing cost of treatment for medication errors or non-compliance. The average cost of a single hospitalization for a preventable medication error is $15,000, which totals in the billions of dollars each year nationally. Experts on healthcare economics agree that the costs from language-related medication errors will continue to increase over time unless healthcare providers meet demands for improved translation services. Furthermore, chain pharmacies have had both the time and necessity of integrating translation software. New York passed such laws in 2009 and Oregon's law passed in 2019. Second is safety. Certified translation companies use a rigorous multi-step vetting process in their translation of prescription labels. One example of a vetting process is first, translation by a native speaking linguist with the appropriate medical background. Second, editing by a second individual with the same qualifications. Third, back translation into Engl English by a separate team. Fourth, reconciliation between the original and back translation to resolve any discrepancies in the final translation. And fifth, final medical linguist review of the translation. The risk of a medication error is far lower than when sending a patient home with a prescription bottle in a language they can't read or understand. In addition, AB 177 provides protection to pharmacists using these certified translation companies. They can't be held liable for a translation error. The third topic is dual labels. Dual language labels ensure that both patients with LEP and their English-speaking pharmacists, caregivers, and providers know what the prescription label says. Here's an example. The instructional phrase called a SIG, such as take one tablet by mouth daily, um, that's called a SIG. So here's the English SIG and here's the translation. For this bill to be effective, the translated SIG must be on the bottle, not in a supplemental packet. The reality is that many patients have upwards of five medications, plus kids with medications of their own. It's not realistic to expect a patient to keep track of five plus instruction packets, then match the correct packet with the correct medication bottle. If the translated SIG isn't on the bottle, the safety of Nevadans will continue to be at risk. The intent of the bill is that if the SIG would ordinarily go on the bottle in English, it must also go on the bottle in the translation. Both the English and the translated SIG will fit on a normal sized bottle in most situations. However, there are several options to address uncommon situations where extra room is needed, including pullout tabs or folding a second label in half and sticking it to the bottle, which is a common practice that pharmacists use called flagging. Um, fourth, laws in other states. Currently, Oregon, New York, and California have laws governing translation of prescription labels. But I urge your caution in considering the California law, which is extremely limited. It only mandates that a specific list of 15 SIGs be translated into just five languages, and it allows pharmacies to put the, the SIG in a supplemental packet rather than on the bottle. These unsafe standards would completely undermine the effectiveness of AB 177. In contrast, the Oregon law requires that all SIGs be available in at least 14 languages and that the translation must appear on the bottle. Like Oregon, Nevada can certainly do better to protect its residents. It's in a pharmacist's code of ethics to communicate with patients in terms that are understandable and to respect personal and cultural differences among patients. Thank you for your consideration. I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Majority Leader and Ms. Ballard for your presentation. We'll now go to the committee members um, for questions. Okay, we can start with Assembly Member Dickman. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, 
um, majority leader for bringing this bill. I think it is also important, but I did have a couple questions. One, um, so in your chart, it, I think I counted 12 languages. Is that what we're looking at to do? As many as 12, I mean. Thank you for the question through assembly, or through Chairwoman Haregi to Assemblywoman Dickman. Majority and, leader, you can go directly to the members. Well, I appreciate that. So if you see um, section one sub three, it says that the board shall adopt regulations prescribing, and then uh, it goes into the languages in which the pharmacies are required to provide the information. And in other states, they have taken approach of kind of just setting a number of um, a hard fast number in statute. I, I, I don't think it's the best policy to set a hard fast number in statute. I would say instead, it makes the most sense to look at our demographic data and projections and then ensure that we are serving the community as the data tells us the composite of the community. And so uh, and so that 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 would be I think the best legislative goal would be to allow the the board to look at those demographics and those data and then make the decision on the number of languages from there. So, so appreciate that. Um, so so it wouldn't be, you know, in, in Washoe, we have to have 14 different labels, right? But once Likely. again, I want to defer back to what the data and demographics are going to tell us and and what our, how our population is growing. And I think we I think that way you, you write a policy that doesn't have to come back and be updated every decade. You've got a law that is going to be more amenable to our communities as they change. May I, may I ask one more question, if it's okay? Yes, follow up. Assembly Thank, you so, Thank you so much. So um, your other presenter, I'm so sorry, I forgot your name, but um, you had talked a little bit about cost, but in general and what it would cost if we don't do this. But what do you, do you have a rough idea of what it might cost to implement this and who absorbs that cost? Would it be the pharmacy or um, who would absorb the cost? Uh well, this uh, through Chairwoman Haregi, uh, well, I guess to Assemblyman Dickman, thank you for letting me go through straight through to her. So right now, as the bill is written, it, this is a this is absolutely a requirement of the pharmacy um, to uh, to 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 enact this. So they would have the label on English. And then the way that um, most and I'm going to let them speak for themselves about their capability. I don't think they would be comfortable with me speaking for them. I can tell you what I've heard in different conversations about what they can and can't print, but um, but it would be about the pharmacies right now ensuring that the ability to translate the label. So they would absorb any cost, correct? Like software or whatever they need to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in talking with one FCQC locally, uh, they let me know that um, with the software and translation service they use, it would be an additional $50 a month for them to get access to 50 more languages. Um, another reason why I don't think why we want a static, static number in statute, because mm -hmm. we don't want to force people to artificially purchase more languages than they have to. But some other systems have told me it would be $12 million. So I think I've had trouble, or I, I have been open about trying to find a way to, to reconcile the wide ranges that people are talking about from $50 a month to, to 12 million. And one more quick one, if, I, if I'm allowed. It's on, on section five. Go to other members first and then I'll circle back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And I've got a couple questions because there were some terms that were used that I wanna make sure that I understand them. So, um, and I apologize, the, the second presenter, I did not catch your name fast enough, but we were talking about medically certified translators. And I know um, whenever I wanna put out something in multiple languages, or if I try to put up notices in multiple languages, there are so many different dialects. And sometimes it means one thing, if someone's from a certain area in South America versus someone from Cuba versus someone from Mexico. So I guess I wanna understand medically certified translators because there are so many different dialects. I would hate to 
have the wrong thing out there. And that kind of leads me to my to the second question of if it if it doesn't end up being correct, who is actually held responsible? So I guess I need to understand a little bit more about the software and what these certified translators are and if that's the safety valve to make sure that things are translated correctly. Uh, thank you. Uh, Assembly, Assemblywoman Carton, I'm going to start and then I'll let uh, Kate answer as well. And so um, the medically certified translators, this is what is required if you're in a clinical setting. So for example, if you work in a hospital, although you might be a native speaker of a language, you're not allowed to translate unless you have that certificate of translation that you've taken the courses and passed the test. So for example, I'm conversational Spanish, but I'm not fluent Spanish and I'm not a certified translator. So when you're in those clinical settings, um, most of them will have a 1-800 number that you can call to get access to translation services. And that's all verbal. That's the piece that we were talking about with the ACA and the Civil Rights Act, that um, most of that's been translated as that verbal piece. Um, and it, even at the, and so that that's what we mean by the medically certified and the third parties. Um, and the word is terms of responsibility for not having accurate translation. I'll let Ms. Uh, Ballard talk about what medical translation looks like specifically, but I will say that um, having ongoing conversations with the Justice Association, and we're going to hear testimony from them about, I think, parity and liabilities around span verbal translation, and then this bill, which does a written translation, and um, their arguments for why the written translation ought to be have the same protections as uh, verbal translation, but I'll let Ms. Ballard talk a little bit more in the weeds about that medical translation piece. Thank, sure, you. thank, thank you for your question, Vice Chair Carlton. For the record, my name is Kate Ballard. Um, so uh, as for the accuracy of the translations, in, in my testimony, I did go over kind of the step-by-step -step process, but to address your question more specifically, um, the differences in dialect should be identified in that um, vetting process where it's reviewed by independent groups and independent individuals and where one translation um, is created, that vetting process is then reviewed by an independent group of individuals. And so hopefully at that point, those dialect or slight differences um, across geographies would be um, weeded out. Um, now, this is the same uh, kind of uh, rigorous process that's already used for verbal um, communications as well. And so um, I hope that kind of answers your question um, about differences in dialects. Um, I will as well say that we've learned that sometimes differences in dialects um, aren't reflected in uh, writings. And so... Um, that kind of varies as well. Um, um, does that answer your question? And thank you very much, Madam Chair. If I could just quickly follow up when the conversation about the software. So since the majority leader is getting so many different um, opinions on what the software is, and this has been done in your state, Mrs. Ms. Ballard, do you happen to know how much the software costs the pharmacies in your state, were you able to ask any of them what the real cost of doing business is? Um, yes. So, um, uh, Vice Chair Carlton, uh, it varies widely, um, as was mentioned before, depending on the kind of software that the pharmacy or healthcare system already has. Um, for chain pharmacies that have multiple locations and very complex, uh, expensive software that they already have, it can be more expensive to integrate it. However, um, one large hospital system in Oregon, it costs them $25,000 to translate 1,000 SIGs and have it automated, like an automated process set up where it automatically pulls what language the English speaks from the chart. It doesn't even have to be requested and then spits out a translated label. That cost for 1,000 directional phrases was $25,000. However, um, for an independently owned pharmacy in Oregon that provided translated labels before the even law, uh, law went into effect, um, for um, 14 languages, it cost them $70 a month. Um, and then there was another company in Oregon that would provide 100 SIGs in one language for a $250 one-time payment. Um, those are um, just kind of some of the examples. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. 
for your questions. Um, I, ha I had a quick question right now that we were speaking um, about the cost in Oregon. Do you have any hard data that you can share with us on if like this has helped um, reduce the numbers of misuse of prescriptions and how, how much it has helped? Um, thank you for your question, Chair Haudegui. Um, uh, I wish I had more hard data. It has only been three months since the law took effect, and so unfortunately, I don't have the kind of hard data compiled. But I will say that in my personal opinion as a nurse, I feel much more confident now being able to discharge a patient from the hospital um, with a label that they can read. Thank you, Ms. Ballard. I'm going to go to... Oh, real quick, Chair Haudegui, if I could respond. So I imagine that the data will follow because there's the federal language um, law and mandate. We are just starting to see, I think, what is a very exciting movement around language equity in this space. Um, start to starting to have these conversations about the health information and prescriptions, and so. Um, you'll notice that in my opening testimony, I think I referenced five or six studies and I'm talking with the committee manager. Some of them are copyrighted because it would have been much easier for me just to present them as exhibits and put the data information in your hand. But because of some copyright issues, I needed to cite all the sources in my testimony. But there are five different studies regarding um, adverse drug effects and the link to language. Um, there are, there's um, four, uh, there are so many studies, chairwoman, and uh, and I've been working with your committee manager about which ones that we can um, make sure live in exhibits and then which ones are going to have to be paper copies that are circulated for you folks. Thank you, Majority Leader. I appreciate that. I'm going to go to Assembly Member Hardy next. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the question, and thank you, Majority Leader, for the presentation. Um, so my question is, what currently happens um, for non-English speaking patients? You know, like you go into the pharmacy and usually the pharmacist will, you have a little consultation and they explain it or whatever. So like what happens currently? Do they, if they can't communicate with them or they just hand them their bag and off they go? Thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy. That's a great question. And no, the, the pharmacists in our state, they do, I will say this, if you've ever walked into a pharmacy, you've never seen a pharmacist sitting down. They are so busy and they are doing so much and I know they care. So no, I don't believe that they would just kind of hand a bag. They are required in that setting while they're at the pharmacy to have translation services. So they will have a 1-800 number available so that they can translate at that time with that person. Where this bill becomes important and where the difference is, is once they walk out that door and once they're in their home setting, they are left with nothing in their own language and, and without the ability to um, have translation services at hand. And so that's, I, that's the distinction that we're trying to get is making sure this information follows the patient um, into, their, into their home setting. And then if I, just one quick follow-up, if that's okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, and so I understand, like you mentioned, uh, several states that um, are starting to do this, but is this bill based pretty much off the Oregon one? Is that right? Thank you so much for the question. So this bill is specific to Nevada in that we're just looking at the NRS 639.280. So if you look at NRS 639.280, there are nine data points that we require, that the pharmacy board requires to be on the prescription label. And so what we are asking is for that to be translated into different languages. Ideally, and if it were the will of the committee, I would love to see more um, information translated. But I, I think that it sounds so simple, but I think if we get just the label done, we are in a great place for our citizens. And so that's how it's a uniquely Nevada bill. And I have to say, I felt um, this bill came to me because I was talking out loud over the summer with some friends about the frustration of the role that I had as a professional social worker in the medical field, working in people's homes uh, and feeling like I, I was not serving them best because we have so many language issues. And someone said, well, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. They've done something about it in Oregon and, and California did something a, year, a couple of years ago. So 
um, we got in touch with Oregon. So I don't I don't want anyone to think that this was me raising my hand saying, hey, I want to do something that's done outside of Nevada and bring it here. Because you guys know me, that's not me. I'm the first one to say, well, if if, if Florida jumped off a bridge, should Nevada jump off a bridge? I mean, that's kind of classic me. It came to me kind of because I think I verbally put it out in the universe about my level of frustration and my concern for people in the home. And that's how it came to be. Thank you for that um, explanation. Thanks. Okay, I am going to go to Assembly Member O'Neill next. Thank you, Chair. You caught me off guard there for a second. Um, I want to. This goes to I think Ms. Ballard. I need. I just want to clarify, and it's sort of building upon what Vice Chair Carlton said. Did you say that the liability for the translations is assumed by the pharmacy and not the translating company? Um, thank you for your question, Assemblyman O'Neill. Uh, no, the bill actually provides liability protection for pharmacists who are acting in good faith and contract with a certified medical translation company. They cannot be held liable for a translation error. As if Section 5 is now, and I, I agree with you, that's the way it should be. The liability should be the person that did the work. So I appreciate that clarification for me. Um, also, in Oregon, I, you said it's only been three months, so you probably can't answer this. But did this increase costs of any of the medications now? I mean, we already complain about the high cost of medications. Was there any increase in costs? Um, thank you for your question. Uh, no, not that I've observed. There has been no increase in cost. I know that it was intended by the champions um, and the senators and representatives in Oregon who championed the bill to ensure that it did not raise the cost of medications. And the pharmacies that we worked with and various stakeholders throughout that process ensured that that would not occur. Um, I can't speak for Nevada specifically, but I would imagine that it will not. I appreciate it. And can I just ask one last clarifying question, Madam Chair? Follow up, Mr. Please. Yes. Um, first, it's Nevada. Gosh, I excuse me. I am so sorry. We what? say Oregon wrong. <laughs> Nevada, excuse me. I apologize. No, that's fine. Um, that wasn't the question, though. I just want to, uh, you know, we're all here and I really appreciate it. I, I like the intent of this bill because we're really here for the betterment of our citizens and to improve health care. And this is one as aspect of health care, improving health care. And I think it's an excellent uh, bill to, to do that. And I appreciate, as I said, our um, Ms. Benitez Thompson bringing this forward and you explaining it. I just want to make sure one thing. If I understand the process correctly, when the foreign language speaker comes in, there isn't a delay in getting him or her the medication. They would just go to their computer and request it to be translated into XYZ, and it comes out immediately. He, the pharmacy doesn't have to go off and delay the uh, delivery. Thank you so much. I can respond to that, uh, Assemblyman O'Neill. So the, we have a FCQC that does this locally and the, that pharmacist, it's a click of a button. Okay, that's what I wanted to make sure of. Because I, I, we're trying to improve healthcare is what we're here for. I just want to make sure there wasn't a delay in that. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member O'Neill. Next, I am going to go to Assembly Member Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the presentation. I'm really uh, glad to see this. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of ask a, a question that I, I think other people were maybe trying to get to, or maybe I was just going there myself, is I understand um, the lives and the health that, you know, that is being saved um, by being able to look at your prescription bottle and read it in your own language and make sure that you're taking it the correct way. So I can see the savings there. Um, but uh, just in the three months since Oregon has started this law, um, have there been any pharmacies that um, refused to do this or closed down? Or, you know, was this any kind of a significant um, force to stop? Um, or essentially, um, 
are people able to do this and, you know, to help folks get their prescriptions and be able to read them? So far, I've personally seen good success with pharmacies in Oregon. Um, in Oregon, the, the Oregon Board of Pharmacy, uh, while we were creating this bill, um, said that the way that they approach uh, compliance is that they don't take a punitive approach. Instead, they try to work with pharmacies toward compliance, understand what the obstacles they face are. Now, um, so that's kind of the approach that they take. Um, uh, as for Nevada, um, uh, I, I can't speak specifically for the Board of Pharmacy there. Um, and I will add as well that independently owned pharmacies typically face more conservative um, costs um, in the face of this bill. Does that answer your question adequately? I think it does, but you haven't seen um, any pharmacies close. It's just a matter of maybe there's a time to ramp up or, or to, to get accustomed to it. Exactly. I've not heard of any pharmacies closing down to my knowledge. Thank and you. I'm sure that I would have uh, heard about it if it happened, I would hope. And, and if I could add a piece there, um, as written right now in Section 2, the effective date is upon um, passage and approval. Um, I would be more than willing to talk with stakeholders about uh, the regulation part and how the regular, because typically we can say uh, passage and approval, starting the regulations and then giving a year for all of that to happen. And then the, the time to start where the pharmacies have to take action. Um, I don't know that, uh, quite honestly, we've been in a place with conversations where we've gotten to section two, but that is something that we want to be sensitive to, um, to the concerns about, yeah, if we asked people to turn a switch tomorrow, it might be pretty costly. But if we looked and made sure people had time as they're exploring vendors or system upgrades, that, that they would have that time. Thank you, Assemblymember Considine. Next, I am going to go to Assemblymember Kasama. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, the, I love all the, the um, explanation and, and the presentation and how it would be helpful for everybody. And I can um, certainly see that. And so it's interesting for me to learn. I didn't realize that if somebody goes into a pharmacy right now in the state of Nevada, there is an online translation service. Is, is that correct? If they need help with tra translating the prescription? Kate, do you want to, I, and I um, find translations, like you don't mean Google Translate. No, I, I thought you said that right now, if somebody comes in. No, they, it's a phone, it's a phone call. Yes, that's what I, thank you for clarifying Assemblywoman Kasama. So when you're in there, when you're in the setting and you were talking with your pharmacist, if you were not language proficient, the pharmacist per uh, a ACA and civil rights would call a translator to have a conversation with you. I see. So, um, but the, the person that is getting the prescription translated, they can take, they can take notes as in their language as to what should be done and they can go home with that. They could perhaps do that, although in my practice, I have not seen that done. Um, sometimes in-person interpreters are willing to write out translations, but uh, that is dependent on the uh, individual's preference. I will also say that now, especially during COVID times, I have seen there has been a huge increase in virtual or phone interpreters being used. And so um, it's it would the interpreter would not be there to write things down down for them. And orally, there's always, you know, the potential for mistakes to happen when it's going from one person to another, and then that person's writing it down. It is much safer to just give them the in translated instruction there that has been vetted. And I, I can see that, that it might be, you know, better to have it written, but I'm just concerned about the cost that goes to these uh, pharmacies and the, re and the requirements. And um, I know my my parents were immigrants and didn't speak English, and they had a lot of trouble with with things like this and renting a house and forms. And um, but they got help from the community and they rallied. And it wasn't easy, but it is some of the steps that they took. So I'm I I understand the intent. It's all good. I'm just concerned about the cost being added to it. Thank you. Okay, my 
Next, I have questions from Assembly Member Tolls. Thank you so much, Chair, and um, thank you, Majority Leader, for um, bringing this discussion forward. Certainly, communication is key, and, and making sure that people understand um, what it is they're taking is so important um, for all the reasons you outlined. But um, I'm wondering if ha has the pharmacy board had a chance to review this language and maybe run it by their members and get feedback because we are hearing so many different levels of estimates of cost or questions around implementation. Did the pharmacy board get a chance to weigh in or are they available uh, to weigh in? Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Tolls. I believe they are on the call. Um, so I'll, I'll let them represent for themselves. Majority Leader, yes. I believe we have a Dave West with the board. Mr. West, are you on? I am. It's Dave Weiss from the Board of Pharmacy, the executive of the board. I just if you could repeat the question so I could make sure it's clear to me. Sure. I just wanted to um, see if you had any input as you've um, maybe consulted with other pharmacy boards and other states that have implemented this, how, how the implementation was, how you envisioned the implementation here in Nevada, and, and what if you've surveyed the members in Nevada, uh, what the costs will be, just so, just so we can get a, a more clear overarching answer. So I am I'm, I'm obviously familiar with the bill. Uh, the concept of the bill would be even people able to communicate with each other, of course, is the right way forward. We want people to understand the, uh, the pharmacists do have an obligation to counsel the um, patients. And so, yeah, they use several different mechanisms, one of which would be like telephone translators and that kind of thing. Um, the bill in Oregon is relatively new, so I put a call into the Oregon board, but didn't hear anything back now. But I think there's still, I think you heard from Kate, it's still in the implementation process. So I'm not sure what feedback. As far as the cost goes, I think you're going to see it wide ranging. I think if people do a simple fix, it's not going to be that expensive. And then when you're changing multi-million dollar systems, that might be more expensive. But uh, the board feels that we work for you, and if you implement this law, we will make it work one way or another. Thank you. Um, follow up, Madam Chair? Say, uh, Member Tolls. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I appreciate that. Um, and again, I love the intent, and I hear the concerns um, also and I'm wondering if there's a way to consolidate, and, and perhaps I can take this offline with the, the sponsor, um, a way to, to accomplish this task in a way that um, that will help with the cost-saving concerns of just having a, a consolidated one statewide source where you could get that translation um, printed out from the state and, and still accomplish the same goal um, that we're trying to accomplish here. But that's something I can take offline. I'm just trying to address the concerns that have been raised while still accomplishing the, the goal, because I think it's a good goal. Thank you, Assembly Member Tolls. Um, I'm going to come to Assembly Member Dickman. Assembly Member Dickman, um, I just want to remind you that we still need to go to testimony, and we have another bill to hear, and we lose members at 4 p.m to another um, committee meeting. So if you could please make it um, prompt. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'm still on the liability just a little bit. I know we touched on it and I believe uh, the majority leader said you're still kind of working on that. But currently if, if you get your prescription in English and um, it's incorrect, you have some recourse. I hate to use the word sue, but, but there are protections in place. So who is liable? I mean, we have to protect this patient, too. I, and it, you kind of made it clear that the uh, pharmacy would not be liable. Would the translator be liable? Thank you so much for the question, Assemblywoman Dickman. So you're going to hear from the Nevada Justice Association later right now in opposition because of that of that section in Section 5. Um, they they obviously know law and liability more than, than I do. And we've been able to talk a little bit. And it's my understanding they're going to talk a little bit um, about uh, the parity that they would be seeking between verbal translation and then written translation, and it's an it's an argument that I'm I'm open to. So Thank I would you. 
that's time. It's it's that uh, why liability is a work in progress. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Dickman. And it looks like we have Assembly Member Martinez. Close this out. Thank you, Chair. So the question I have is that this would be most most helpful and useful so that you could go home and read the um, information from your prescription in the privacy of your home. Um, I mean, I think our prescriptions are very private. We don't want everybody to know. So I wouldn't really want to take it to my neighbor and let them know what my medical needs. Some things are very private. So by them being able to take this home, this would make it uh, more private and very useful, wouldn't it, to, um, Assembly Majority Leader? Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Martinez. I'm, I'm, I mean, absolutely. I think people, my experience has been is that patients don't want to do one main thing, which is appear to be a burden to their family and or appear to be a burden at all. And so this this kind of manifestation of toughness means we don't often ask questions or ask for help. And so um, I, th I think that there's, um, well, I don't necessarily have data on it. Um, I think that there is a sensitivity to what some of these prescriptions are and that people would rather be able to of limited English proficiency, be able to read them and then better manage and be in charge of their own health care because they're empowered by the simple act of reading the information in a language that they can understand. Thank you. I agree. Thank you, Assembly Member Martinez. And with that, we are going to move into the testimony portion of our bill hearing. I just want to let everyone know because we still do have another bill to hear after this and I lose members to the 4 p.m. committees. I will be limiting testimony on both bills to 30 minutes in each category. So 30 minutes in support, 30 minutes in opposition, 30 minutes in neutral. And with that, I will go to support of Assembly Bill 177. I'm going to go to those who signed up to testify virtually first. Do I have Amy Koo with the Asian Community Development Council? Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the, the opportunity today to testify for AB 177. My name is Amy Koo, A-M-Y-K-O-O. And I am the Deputy Political Director with One API in Nevada. I first want to thank Assemblywoman Benitez Thompson for centering language access and health equity. Nevada is home to over 300,000 Asian Pacific Islander Americans, comprising about 10% of the total population. We focus on the issues that affect our livelihood, including language access and healthcare. As the fastest growing community in Nevada, we are aware that the infrastructure to support the community in tangible ways is lagging. I myself have been a translator for my parents for as long as I can remember. Like many second generation children, my parents relied on me to fill a gap in language access in our institutions. When my parents would have changes in medication or need to read dosage instructions, they relied on me to ensure that they were taking it correctly. There are currently approximately 300,000 limited English proficient Nevadans who are also facing these barriers to healthcare. For new immigrants and mixed fluency households, having prescription instructions in both English and their native language is a critical step to ensuring healthcare parity for all Nevadans. Currently, about one in one out of five emergency room visits is due to a preventable medication error. One case of a mistaken medication can cost up to $10,000 in hospital fees. In New York State, where a similar translation bill for prescription labels was passed in 2012, we saw that from 2006 to 2015, there was an increase in pharmacies that reported translating labels daily from 15.4% in 2006 to 66.7% in 2015. This is a great opportunity to advance language justice in Nevada. AB 177 is a cost-effective and critical step to ensuring that all Nevadans have health care parity. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Koo. Next, we have Tamara Tellis with the University of Nevada, Reno. Yes, hello. Thank you, Madam Chairman and committee members for having me today. Um, I'm Tamara Tellis. I live in Gardnerville, Nevada, and I'm a public health diversity advisor at the University of Nevada, Reno in health sciences. So last year, my team and I conducted a study and found a need for improved Latinx communications, especially around health, um, especially with the pandemic. Uh, a couple key findings from that research was where the lack of good communication and translations that um, create an additional barrier to care and increases the burden of disease in Nevada. 
Also using online translation tools like Google Translator um, don't always translate things correctly and therefore are not reliable for translation from English to Spanish or any other language for that matter um, and creating more disparities. So with that being said, I support this first language health services because this is a simple change that can be, that can really create a huge and positive impact. Um, according to the 2019 Nevada State Health Needs Assessment, over 30% of Nevada's population is Latinx and is a population that continues to increase the most. So for many, English is their second language. In addition, the immigrant share for the population is near a historic high, um, according to the Pew Research, and nearly half have limited English proficiency um, or the ability to speak English and is very, not very well. Um, this bill would not be duplicating any other health services where creating other health services would be more expensive and staff intensive. Um, you know, there's many different disparities along the Latinx communities. Um, one being translating uh, to is too technical and sometimes too risky for family and members and friends. Um, like many children are the translators for their parents and children should not have to be relied on to read prescriptions. I mean, prescriptions can be challenging just in English, right? Um, so other types of health navigator services would also be more expensive and are not 24-7, um, you know, so nurse navigators, community health workers, and so on and so forth. So this would really make a big difference. Um, health and language equity is really important. Everyone has a right to be served in the, their first language. Um, reading prescription labels, again, is challenging enough, and I cannot imagine trying to translate my medication from one language that I'm not confident in and trying to basically consume that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tellis. Next, we have Barry Gold with AARP Nevada. Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Barry Gold with AARP Nevada. This appears to be a very simple public policy, but this has and will have a huge impact on improving public health. Um, many of you have heard me um, use the old saying that life-saving drugs do not work if you can't afford to take them. You could also say life-saving drugs do not work if you don't know what they are or how to take them. In the past, Nevada passed a bill several sessions ago, thinking it was David Bob Zine's bill, that said you could put the reason or symptom for the drug you take on your pill bottle. So for example, pantoprazole for heartburn or GERD. Well, you know what? If you can't read what that label says, that isn't going to help you. So individuals, family members and caregivers who often assist people with taking their medicines really need to be able to understand what the prescription drugs are and how to take them. Now, we heard earlier that the average person takes about five prescription drugs. If you're going to talk about older adults, it's very often they have 10 or more prescription drugs. How many of us have walked into our grandma's house and seen a table full of prescription drug bottles, 10, 15, 20, and she has no idea what they are. And if she can't read what's on them, that's even worse. So we really need to make so, have some way to make this a little better. So um, AARP Nevada, on behalf of the 345,000 members across the state, strongly, strongly support the passage of AB 177 that is really going to help Nevadans have better health, com health outcomes if they are just able to read their prescription bottles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gold. Next, we have Jose Partida representing himself. Do we have a Jose Partida? Okay, we will move on to Jillian Block with the Nevada Coalition of Legal Service Providers. Okay, we will move on to Christine Saunders with the Progressive Leadership Alliance of Nevada. Okay, broadcasting, can we check the telephone line to see if there's anyone on wishing to testify in support? Yes, Chair. To testify in support of AB 77, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And again, to testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue.
Caller with the last three digits of 130, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christine Saunders. That's Christine, or C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-S-A-U-N-D-E-R-S. -E -E and I'm a policy director at the Progressive Leadership Alliance in Nevada, here in support of AB 177. This bill is a simple solution that will address a discriminatory practice that leaves many Nevadans unprotected at a time when they are the most vulnerable. It is a vital step to safeguard patients, reduce long-term costs, and provide language justice for Nevadans. We urge your support. Thank you. Thank you. Broadcasting next caller. Caller with the last three digits of 261. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and we'll begin. Good afternoon and thank you, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jillian Block, G-I-L-L-I-A-N-B-L-O-C-K. I am speaking in support of AB 177 on behalf of the Coalition of Legal Service Providers. We are supportive of efforts to make prescription drug labeling more accessible to low-income community members that we serve, who oftentimes primarily speak a language other than English. This bill aligns with our consumer protection goals to ensure that people have meaningful access to the important information that they need to make critical decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Block. I'm broadcasting next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of six, Seven two. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, committee. For the record, my name is Joelle Gutman Dodson, J O E L L E G U T M A N, with the Washoe County Health District today. Um, we're here in support for this important bill. Um, we believe it's a common sense, safe, and important step towards closing the gaps in health disparities. Uh, we urge your support for AB 177. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Broadcasting. Next caller. Yes, sir. Caller with the last three digits of 653. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and the committee. This is Dora Martinez. I'm representing the Nevada Disability Peer Action Coalition, and I um, um, am in support of AB 177, and I would like to emphasize on the population who are American Sign Language speakers, and um, just to be aware that they do not read English as the first language is ASL. So just so you guys are aware and put that in there somewhere to um, have equal access to medication. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you so much for calling, broadcasting, next caller. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Thank you so much, Broadcasting. And I will come back to video. It looks like I did skip someone on my list who's been patiently waiting. I apologize. Do I have DM Nguyen on the line to testify in support? Um, hi, Madam Chair. Thank you for, up to, um, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Diem Nguyen. I'm Health Navigator of Asian Community Development Council. Um, I live in Vega for seven years and I work for Vietnamese community across the state to enroll health insurance. I'm, testi uh, I'm testifying in support AB 177. As we know, there are 68,000 uh, limited English households across the, uh, the state. ACDC is the partner of Nevada Healthlink and we have bilingual staff in Tangalo, Vietnamese, Chinese, and, Sp uh, and Spanish. We are passionate about healthcare, poverty, and language access. I talked to my client about their care, and Vietnamese client prefer the Ms. Nguyen, are you there? 
Can you hear us? Ms. Nguyen? Ms. Nguyen, looks like we might have lost you. Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Okay. Perfect. Please continue, and if you also have your statements in uh, writing, please feel free to share them with our committee manager so she can make sure um, the committee members receive them since we are you are cutting in and out. Okay. Um, in, in case, uh, some some of the small Vietnamese com uh, community life spot, they have to travel or uh, use the Google Translate to read information. The I'm so sorry, Ms. Nguyen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Maybe um, our internet is not good. I will, I will, uh, I will send information by the chat. Is okay with you, or I will reply the email. Yes, if you would just send in your written remarks via email to our committee manager, we will make sure we post them as an exhibit for this bill and share them with the committee. I think that's better. <laughs> I'm so sorry for internet is so terrible now. No worries. We thank you for being a part of the process and for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. With that, we are going to move to testimony in opposition of Assembly Bill 177. I will start with those who have signed up to participate on video first. I believe we can start with Ms. McMiniman. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you for being here. Thank you, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity that I've been given to speak on AB 177, and I thank the sponsor for the work that we've done so far. RAN is proud to represent many of the, the community pharmacies in Nevada. A pharmacist is one of the top three most trusted professions for many years now. They're accessible to patients, and taking care of the patient is something they take very seriously. Our members are proud of the services they offer every Nevada and the community they serve. This is true inside their physical locations, as well as going out to different locations within the community. Um, and, and they've been doing a super job. Uh, community pharmacies stand ready to serve our community health needs daily and during times of emergency. These pharmacies include the traditional drug stores, the supermarkets, the uh, mass mass retailers, mass merchandisers that have pharmacists, as well as our independents, which we have woefully few of in Nevada. RAN members believe in including every citizen, our group, our community in Nevada in, in taking care of their health care needs. Uh, hold on, I'm sorry. Uh, let me let me get this. AB 177 seeks to mandate pharmacies print two different labels and affix these labels to the prescription drug bottles, one which must be in any language requested by a customer at this, po at this point in time, the language reflects that. The members understand the need of the communities that this bill intends to assist and have been working for years to try to provide such service for them. Retail pharmacies recognize that not all customers are fluent or prefer to use English in their daily lives. Because the primary language of medicine is English, many terms and instructions do not easily translate. And um, we believe that the verbal consultation and a certified translator is a gold standard that allows customers to have a complete understanding of their medication and how to use it safely and effectively. There are directives in the store. The pharmacist is always there to help that patient that may not be a English speaking patient. And they will guide them to, and also get on the 1-800 number for a better understanding of their direction of the medic medications. Anyone can call this number at any time. Any family member within the home is, has access to this number to get the translation if there's no understanding and the patient ha can call. And it is a 24 seven number. There is always someone there. We have, some trans we have the same translators as hospitals and we provide it outside of clinical settings also. Public health and pharmacies have a strong history of reaching mutual public health goals together for the benefit of all patients in our state. 
We appreciate the sponsor adding the third party liability uh, to the language and removal of that language would raise even more concerns for our members at this time. We would like the opportunity to work with the sponsor of the bill and to improve services to every community in Nevada, specifically the minorities and those with limited English speaking skills. Rand believes we need to have further discussions with stakeholders as we have concerns and, and oppose the language as it is written today. We'd like to thank the sponsor again for engaging those in the industry um, and look forward to working with her as we go forward and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. McMiniman for your testimony today. Next, we will go to Paul Moradkin with the Vegas Chamber. Do I have Mr. Paul Moradkin on? Okay, next I will go to Nick Vanderpool with the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. Okay, do I have Brian Wachter with the Retail Association of Nevada? Okay, and do I have Graham Galloway with the Nevada Justice Association? Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Graham Galloway um, of the Nevada Justice Association. We are generally supportive of this bill. Um, we think it's a good bill and we think it establishes good public policy, but we do have some difficulties with the immunity provision set forth in paragraph or section five of the bill. Um, and therefore, as a formality, we're opposed to it as, as the bill is presently uh, set forth. We would be fully supportive of the bill if it was amended and uh, amended in the matter of removing Section 5, the liability section. Um, immunity is a difficult um, concept for the, the Justice Association, particularly in view of last special session where huge grants of immunity were established. Um, immunity restricts access to the court. Immunity undercuts holding people and entities fully accountable and responsible. If you excuse people's bad conduct, all you do is encourage a lack of diligence. And lastly, immunity has unintended consequences. And in this bill, if you leave the immunity provision in, you establish two sets or two classes of individuals, those who speak English who don't have to deal with any immunity issues and those who don't speak English who then have to uh, deal with an immunity issue. Um, from a constitutional law perspective, I think that raises unintentionally uh, uh, an equal protection uh, consideration or equal protection argument. Um, we appreciate um, uh, the conversations with the sponsor of the bill we appreciate the uh, opportunity to continue to work with the sponsor of the bill. And we're hoping that uh, the amendment that we, we have suggested, again, eliminating Section 5, um, will be considered and that ultimately our opposition will turn into a position of support. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Of broadcasting, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in opposition? Yes, Chair, to testify in opposition of AB 177, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits of 781, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair. I apologize, this is Nick Vanderpool. I missed the email from staff and I appreciate them sending that out with the Zoom information. Um, this is Nick Vanderpool, N-I-C-K-V-A-N-D-E-R-P-O-E-L with Capital Partners, today representing the Reno Sparks Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to oppose a Assembly Bill 177. While we appreciate Majority Leader Benitez Thompson's value effort, we must point out that these individuals that request interpretation have access to various options that were imposed by the American Care Act 
And further, during a time when pharmacies are overrun by pandemic-related issues, including vaccination appointments, it seems overly burdensome to require that an international language accompany a prescription. We know we have limited time to testify in our op opposition, but we did submit a letter detailing our opposition and share some of the same concerns that were outlined by our colleagues at the Retail Association of Nevada. While this bill is well-intentioned and recognizes our increasing diversity and appreciation for its growth, we oppose this bill due to its stringent burden on pharmacies and those employees who want only to assist their customers in an efficient manner. Thank you, Chair and committee members for your time. Thank you, Mr. Vanderpool. Broadcast next caller. Caller with the last three digits of one, two, four. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. For the record, Paul Moradkin, M-O-R-A-D-K-H-A-N with the Vegas Chamber. I apologize as having a connection issues, so I apologize for not being on video. The Chamber does have concerns with the bill as proposed on behalf of our members who would directly be impacted by these proposed changes. We agree that prescriptions should be available in other languages if requested by the customer. However, as you've heard from my colleagues in the Retail Association, pharmacies do print instructions in a variety of languages and offer customers further assistance with the 1-800-LANGUAGE helpline. We are concerned about the cost that would be associated with the requirement to print uh, two labels on prescriptions, the logistical challenges, and the implementation of such a program. We would have grave concern about removing limit, uh, removing liability protections that have been discussed today. Uh, with that said, that we will make the commitment to work with this bill sponsor to find a solution that will help address the nexus of the, the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Moradkin. Broadcast next caller, please. Caller with the last three digits of 700. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Committee on Assembly, Commerce, and Labor. My name is Brian Wachter, B-R-Y-A-N-W-A-C-H-T-E-R, and I serve as the Senior Vice President of the Retail Association of Nevada. Um, I appreciate uh, the comments of those who came before me and, and certainly my colleague, Ms. McMiniman. I did want to concentrate on an area of topic of interest that had been brought up, uh, which is really Oregon. Um, we heard from the Board of Pharmacy representative that that is currently still in its implementation stage. Um, and I want to stress that that is, that is true. This bill actually hasn't been enforced um, or 100% implemented yet in Oregon. Um, the reason for that and why it's taken four years since the passage of the bill to get it done um, is because what the current requirements on that bill and certainly what AB 177 requires goes far beyond um, what's currently available. Um, that's why you have ranges of cost anywhere from, you know, $12 million up to $30 million on some of these systems in order to be able to um, effectively change them and be able to meet the requirements of AB 177. Um, one vendor um, in Oregon actually quoted $12 a prescription um, is what the cost would increase in order to be able to, to meet these requirements. Now, as you know, that that is a cost that the pharmacy is um, not going to pass on to the patient, um, but it is a cost that is going to have to be absorbed into the cost of doing business uh, for our local pharmacies. Um, and that means that anytime we have an increase in the cost of business, um, it puts pressure on employee hours, it puts pressure on operating hours, um, and it certainly puts pressure on whether or not that location can remain solvent going forward. Do we expect that to happen? Um, I think we are uncertain because we don't have the information out of Oregon, but it is certainly something that we are um, seriously taking a look at. Um, I also do want to emphasize that right now in a pharmacy in Nevada, you can get printed instructions for those medications for all the languages um, that the majority leader shared on her screen earlier. Um, that is something that we're proud of and highlighting the fact that, you know, in, outside the clinical setting, uh, patients have access to a 1-800 uh, certified 
a translator that can help them understand their medication. And this is especially important because there are some terms that are not easily um, translated. Uh, for instance, on infusion drugs, um, infusion is typically not um, a phrase that can be easily translated. Um, and so in this case, it actually is helpful to have a live translator who could help walk through exactly what the intent of that is and help that patient actually get um, the medicine the proper and most effective way they can. Um, so for those reasons, I, I join those in opposition, and we look forward to working with the majority leader further on the bill. Chair, there are no more callers in opposition at this time. Chair, you're on mute. Thank you. I just had a long dialogue with myself. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Wachter, for your testimony. Um, now we can move into testimony in neutral. Um, I don't see anyone signed up to testify in the neutral position on video. So broadcast, can we please check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in the neutral position? Yes, Chair. To testify in neutral for AB 177, Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you, broadcasting. Um, Majority Leader Benitez Thompson, would you and Ms. Ballard like to give any closing remarks? I would, thank you, and I appreciate it. So one, I look forward to the continuing work with the stakeholders that we're gonna do on this with working with the Retail Association of Nevada, um, with working pharmacists, with working with pharmacists, and actually it's been really helpful for me to actually talk directly with a number of pharmacists because they can help me get down into the nitty and gritty about their daily operations and how things are, are working. And so that has been one of the most helpful things um, in this bill. Um, there are just two pieces on the record that I think I might um, ask for more clarification on, and if that can come in writing, that's fine. But I think we heard to the, the testimony that um, English or translation services are available everywhere, and that uh, I just want to make sure that that's not misrepresented as to mean that if you, you um, have a service that's readily available to patients, Pharmacies have the ability to call in and do verbal translations there. But when you go into the home, um, they and the conversations I had with the pharmacist, they have the 1-800 number in the pharmacy, but they don't, they don't print it on the bottle. And so if you're just at home with your medication bottle, you are left with unsure about how to call. And then if you do call in, you've got a person with limited English proficiency reading the bottle to a translator, you really need a translator between the two languages. Otherwise, it doesn't work to have to call into a translation services and then you're reading something in another language. I don't I, I hope you get what I mean there, but that's that's kind of the crux of when you have that phone call with the pharmacist right there, the pharmacist speaking in in English and then the person translating to that other person. If you just call in, you're going to lose some of that because the limited English proficiency person will be reading a label back to a translator. Um, the other thing is, is there was mentioned on the record that you have the ability to get all of your prescriptions printed in instructions right now. And so I think I want some clarification on that because there are different pieces out there. This bill is specific to 639-2801, which is the label on the bottle. There are other things like medication guides or patient inserts. Um, and so I'm confused about what is uh, available in other languages, but I will say that it's been my, in my practice, I've never come across those. Um, and there might be a chain provider or one pharmacy who has the ability to print things in English and Spanish because most pharmacies do can do English and Spanish right now. But I, do, I just want to make sure they're not misrepresenting that they can do print a label um, 
in that additional in in all of the different languages that that's the standard across all pharmacies. So that's I just want to make sure y'all aren't thinking that I'm asking you to have a big uh, policy conversation of about something that's already out there and happening. Um, otherwise, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate your consideration. And I would say this, ultimately, I really do feel like this is the right thing to do, but I know the right things to do can come at a cost and I wanna minimize those costs. I'm, and um, I know that we heard testimony that Oregon's taken a while to implement, but, but I think part of that has been um, a lot of generosity to give an, a long implementation time and, and so I wanna be considerate of the implementation time, but I, I also wanna be considerate of the fact too that at some point if we're gonna do this and we make an affirmative public policy decision that this is best for Nevada and our residents and the healthcare system overall, we kind of get there. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll look forward to ongoing conversations and I, I appreciate you hearing me out. Thank you, Majority Leader. With that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 177. Next item on our agenda is Assembly Bill 178. We have uh, one of our members, Assembly Member Melissa Hardy here. I will now open the hearing on Assembly Bill 178. Ms. Hardy, when you're ready, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Melissa Hardy and I represent Assembly District 22. Today, I would like to present Assembly Bill 178 which ensures Nevadans have access to the prescription medications during a state of emergency or declaration of disaster. The COVID-19 pandemic highlights the need to reconsider the rules that limit access to needed prescription drugs for Nevadans, such as older adults and people with underlying health conditions during a declared state of emergency or disaster. Insurance companies generally impose strict limits on the frequency of medication refills. Outside of times of crisis, there are valid reasons insurance companies limit when and how much of certain medications people can obtain at one time. They could be misused, misplaced, or even sold on the black market. Therefore, many people obtain a one month supply of medicine at a time which works well for them. One year ago, to facilitate the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the governor of Nevada declared a state of emergency. Nevadans were asked to limit non-essential activities due to the pandemic and were encouraged to limit their trips outside their homes to gather essential items, such as food and prescription medications in order to stay safe and healthy. During the same time, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention encouraged those at higher risk, particularly older adults and those with underlying health conditions to have at least a 30-day supply of prescription drugs and talk to a healthcare provider, insurer, or pharmacist about obtaining an extra supply of their prescriptions, if possible, to reduce their trips to a pharmacy. So um, as do many of my bills, um, they the genesis for them is from personal experience or in conversations with constituents. So I actually had this happen um, with my own mom she takes blood pressure medication and she needed to um, get that refilled. And at the time she was uncomfortable and didn't feel she wanted to go to the doctor and also wasn't able to go or into a lab so that she could get that refill. Now she's very independent and intelligent and usually takes care of you know, everything that she needs on her own. But this took a little bit of work. Even for me, <laughs> we had to go through several um, loops and processes in order to get that medication for her. Experience came the desire to bring this legislation forward. Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, people need easy access to their medications, which may be difficult during times of social distancing and their ability to meet with healthcare practitioners. States throughout the country have addressed prescription medication refills in times of natural disasters or declared state of emergency. At least eight states, including Arizona, California, Florida, Maryland, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, and Washington, allow pharmacists to dispense early and or provide refills of a prescription under certain circumstances. This measure also shifts how we cover prescriptions during a declared state of emergency or natural disaster in our state. 
So I'm going to give a brief summary of the bill. Um, it would require insurers such as individual health insurance, group and blanket insurance, health insurance for small employees, fraternal benefit societies, reciprocal insurers, health maintenance organizations, managed care, Medicaid, the public employees benefits program, and local governments that provide prescription drug coverage to their employees to waive any restrictions on the time period within which a covered prescription may be refilled for an insured who has not exceeded the number of refills authorized by the prescribing practitioner and lives in the area of the state of emergency or declared disaster within a certain time and authorized payment for a supply of a covered prescription drug for up to 30 days for any insured who requests a refill under these conditions. The commissioner of insurance may extend the time periods as he or she determines necessary. To respond effectively to emergent demands during a state of emergency or natural disaster, the public may need increased access to therapeutic pharmaceuticals. Meeting this need requires safely expanding access to pharmacy services and providing temporary and limited relief from certain regulatory restrictions to enhance the operational capacity, flexibility, and efficiency operations. Currently, a pharmacist may refill a prescription only for the number of times authorized or for the number of times authorized by the prescribing practitioner. Assembly Bill 178 creates an exception to this rule to allow a pharmacist to fill or refill a prescription in an amount that is greater than the amount authorized by the prescribing practitioner, but does not exceed a 30-day supply of the drug if the drug is not a controlled substance listed in Schedule II, the patient lives in an area where a state of emergency or disaster applies, and the drug is necessary for the patient's maintenance of life or the continuation of therapy for a chronic condition and interruption of therapy using the drug may be detrimental to the person's health or produce physical or mental discomfort. A pharmacist who dispenses drugs under these conditions is required to issue a and maintain a written order for dispensing the drug and notify the prescribing practitioner. Uh, you'll notice on Nellis the fiscal notes from the Department of Business and Industry, the Department of Health and Human Services, HEB, and the State Board of Pharmacy indicate there would be no fiscal impact. Most of the local governments note there would be no physical in, fiscal impacts as well. So in closing, AB 178 helps person to maintain a continuous supply of medications during a declared state or of emergency or disaster. The bill requires an insurer to waive restrictions on medication refills during a declared state of emergency and authorizes payment for a supply of the prescription drug for up to 30 days. The measure also authorizes the pharmacist to fill or refill a prescription drug to a person living in an area that is declared a disaster or state of emergency in an amount greater than is authorized by a prescribing practitioner but does not exceed a 30-day supply of the drug under certain circumstances. Um, I have reached out to and have been working with some stakeholders on this bill and um, I value their input and will continue to um, work with them if any concerns arise. And so that includes concludes my remarks. And um, Mr. Weiss from the Board of Pharmacy is here to answer questions. And then if there's anything specific um, legal questions that we have that we can't answer, I'll be happy to um, get those answers from our legal staff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hardy. Um, I'm gonna go to members for questions. We can start with Vice Chair Carlton. Thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. So, uh, Assemblywoman Hardy, you had listed who was in this. I did not hear uh, self-insured groups, which is a lot of folks that work in major industry in Las Vegas. And I also did not hear um, through a health and welfare fund that it would apply to them. So I was just wondering, could you repeat the list or clarify if those two are actually included in the bill. Okay, sure. And now that was a long list, so let me find it here. Okay, here we go. So individual health insurance, group and blanket insurance, 
health insurance for small employees, fraternal benefit societies, reciprocal insurers, health maintenance organizations, managed care, Medicaid, the Public Employees Benefits Program, and local governments. Yeah, I don't believe those are actually in there. I know self-insured groups are not under the jurisdiction of the insurance commissioner, neither uh, as the health and welfare, unless the term fraternal that you're using is meant to aim in that direction. I just wanted to make sure that if you were trying to include those folks, we just wanted to make it very clear that they uh, would be included. So this is just up to a 30-day refill then? Right, correct. That um, that was what, you know, we were kind of thinking 30 days um, would allow someone to then be able to either see the physician or maybe set up a telehealth visit or something like that. But that was something I've been um, working with with folks. If, if we think there should be another greater amount of days or whatever, I'm more than happy to work on that. That was just something I felt was reasonable. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to clarify that list. Whenever we start listing things, there's always the chance that someone could get excluded. So I just wanted to verify that. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And I, I yes, agree. We don't want to leave anyone out. So I will make sure that those are covered or see what we you know, can do to include them. So thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Carlton. And I just I just have a quick clarifying question, uh, Assemblymember Hardy. So if somebody has a prescription and it's a 30-day prescription and they have one refill, um, they get their prescription today and then tomorrow there's a state of emergency, they can immediately get their next 30-day refill. Um, the way I, I would understand it, um, and this may be a legal question, I'm not sure, but if they have a refill available, it would be if they don't have another one coming up, they could, could get it. That's the way I understand. So if, they, so if they don't have another refill coming up, then they would be able to get a refill without a prescription for a refill. Correct. If, um, Mr. Weiss, is that correct? I think uh, this is Dave Weiss for the record. So I think there's two components to the bill, the insurance component, which uh, Nevada law would already allow. You've already put in place, uh, I think, two sessions ago where people could get a larger supply, a 90-day supply, as long as it wasn't a controlled substance and that they had it filled before. That's the 90-day allowance. With this, with the when we're talking about Section 19, Yes, that would be that there is no, the patient's already had it and there is no refill available, but in the state of emergency, they would be able to gain it. Um, through regulations, the board has some ability to allow that now, which we've done the best we can. I think this, this is more comprehensive, Bill, and I can tell you that for the past, during the pandemic early on, we did a waiver of a regulation that would allow pharmacists to do this. Uh, during the emergency, and I have not had one complaint from a patient or a doctor that somebody got the med that they shouldn't have gotten. Um, so I think doing it in, in statute makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Weist. Uh, okay, next we can go to Assembly Member Kasama. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Assemblywoman Hardy, my question is. Um, you know, are the insurance companies okay with this change? Because I'm sure they probably have a policy that says it has to be this way and then this will change statute. And has that been run by them that they're okay with this? Or um, this is above my pay grade or if this changes in the statute, then they just must do it? Or do you have to coordinate with them to, you know, for these changes? Just curious how all that works. Thank you, Assemblywoman Hassana. Melissa Hardy, for the record, um, I have not heard of any opposition to that yet. Um, but like I said, we have been working with stakeholders and would address those concerns. But there have, hasn't been any anything that I have heard in that regards yet. 
So, um, but yes, according to this, that, you know, they would be required to pay for that, that supply, that refill. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will go to assembly member Considine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a question, but um, also just to follow up on uh, Vice Chair uh, Carlton's question. Um, on section, or I guess subsection two of each section talking about the insurer or um, you know all of the other uh, entities that would be uh, taking care of the prescription, it says the commissioner may extend the time periods prescribed by subsection one in increments of 15 to 30 days as he or she determines to be necessary. Does that mean that even though this says uh, you would have one 30 day um, prescription given that the commissioner can then determine that that can go on for two more weeks or another month? Uh, does that sort of extend that time frame? Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman Constantine for the question. Melissa Hardy for the record. I would have to follow up with that with the commissioner unless uh, Mr. Weiss would know that answer. Uh, uh, Dave Weiss, for the record, thank you, Assemblywoman. I, my reading of it is that those sections are related to the insurance coverage. And so, yes, the commissioner would be able to extend the insurance coverage. I think most insurance covers, uh, most insurers want their people to get their prescriptions because it keeps them from, you know, harm. Um, so I think in that section, the insurance commissioner could extend that. The insurance commissioner would not be able to extend the section 19 where the pharmacist is giving a, a extra medication when there's no refill left. Those earlier sections are talking about when there is a refill. Thank you. And uh, then, Chair, if I can ask one more question? Yes. Thank you. And then I just want to get it on the record um, that all of the, the list of, of the insurance uh, avenues have the same language in Section 1 except for Medicaid. It changes a little bit from a shall to a may. So it's my understanding, though, that the Medicaid recipients um, under this, uh, this change shall get the prescriptions, even though the wording in that section is changed. So I just wanted to make sure that, that, that is, my understanding is correct and that that's on the record. Uh, thank you, Assemblywoman. Melissa Hardy for the record. Uh, yes, I did um, ask that question of legal and they, he, uh, Mr. Sam Wast uh, provided an explanation for that. Um, I'm, I can read it, it's quite long. Um, but basically, these, um, let's see. So he said, um, however, I believe these are merely stylistic changes accounting for the differences between the administration of the government Medicaid program and the administration of a private policy of insurers. So, I mean, it was a longer answer. I can on the committee or, or whatever, if you'd like that. But that was his his answer. Yes, I just wanted to make sure that, that his answer, um, if you could put that as part of the record to make sure that the Medicaid recipient has the same options as, as all the others. Thank you. Member Hardy, if you could send that response into the committee manager so she can um, share it with the committee members, that would be great. Okay. And then, um, I, and I, you know, um, Assemblymember Constantine pointed to subsection two of all the sections as well. And I just, um, do we need to add any clarifying language? Because right now it just says, you know, there's section one and then there's sub one and sub one references the state of emergency, but sub two doesn't. And it just says the commissioner may extend the time periods prescribed oh, by section one and increments are 15 to 30 days. Um, I don't know if just referencing subsection one is enough to say that she can only extend it for 15 to 30 days during uh, a state of emergency that those Powers aren't there when we're not when we're no longer in a state of emergency. Okay. Um, next, okay, I we can, uh, I'll, I'll follow up with that as well. Thank you, um, Assembly Member uh, Dickman. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I just have a quick question, and liability seems to be my word of the day. But in Section 19, where the um, where the pharmacist 
can make the decision to uh, extend the prescription beyond what the, the physician or practitioner has said. Could this open up a pharmacist to any kind of new liability if something went wrong with extending that prescription longer than the doctor had prescribed? Thank you, Assemblywoman Dickman, Melissa Hardy for the record. And I think I will let Mr. Weiss answer that question. Dave Weiss for the record. I think that's an excellent question and I'm not an attorney. Um, so we might need to ask them that question. Uh, and there might be a provision in there that you would want to protect the pharmacist. So uh, if that's your intent, but yeah. I think it would be clearer to put a provision that if the pharmacist acts in good faith, that they can't be held accountable. Good, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. And then um, Assembly Member Hardy, if you would get clarification on that and then you can share it with the committee manager so she can share it with the members. Um, I also have a question from Assembly Member O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Weiss, this question is, I need some clarification because I'm constantly reading in page after page and I can cite some of the lines you said that the refill can exceed the number that's authorized by the, the practitioner. So if I'm out of refills, we have an emergency, I can still get a, a refill of my medication. Is that how, did I understand that correctly? I just, I just want to be uh, clear for the record, Dave, we, so we currently, and it's listed at the board website that we have a waiver uh, through regulation, not statute, of course, where during the emergency that if there's a patient that needs to get a prescription refilled and they can't, con they, they attempt to contact the practitioner and they cannot contact the practitioner. This was more likely at the beginning of the pandemic, of course, that the pharmacist could fill that uh, prescription for 30 days couldn't be a controlled substance um, and that they had to notify the practitioner. This language is very similar to the waiver guidance that we've put. And so, yes, this would be in an emergency. And it, it, for my time with the board, it's, it's, I've seen it with um, some hurricanes where people have come from other places. We saw it with the fires over in California when the people came over from the fires and the pharmacy had burnt down. Uh, pharmacists were able to look at stores that were close to them and look at the record while Walgreens, the Walgreens, or whoever it was. And so, uh, yes, they'd be able to fill the prescription for the 35, 30, 30 days, but they have to notify the practitioner as stated in subsection two, subsection B. And again, I don't have a sense for how many times this has happened during the current pandemic, but I have not received a complaint that somebody has been harmed by the current guidance that they could be done now. Anytime it's in statute, that's the best way in my mind that you guys are saying this is what you want as opposed to me doing some waiver. And I appreciate that very detailed response. Because let me just say, if you just start with section one, page two, go to line 11, section three, go to line 19, and it goes on and on again. Do we need to adjust or clarify? It reads on all numerous pages where it says has not exceeded the number of refills authorized by the prescribing practitioner. Yeah, that's a D Dave Weiss for the record. To my interpretation is that it's a different system that's talking about insurance coverage and that they wanna make sure that if the patient has a refill that it's covered by the insurance. When you get to section 19, that's a separate uh, component that's talking about when there is no refill uh, and the pharmacist can use their professional judgment to give the patient some in an emergency. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Thank you, Assemblymember O'Neill. And I do have one last question too. Um, Assemblymember Hardy or Mr. Weiss, if you know, um, this might be a question that you can answer. Um, do you know what happens in an instance where a pharmacist issues a prescription and then within 48 hours notifies a doctor and the doctor says, um, no, that's not a valid prescription. They should not have got one. Who's responsible now from, I guess, collecting that prescription back or making sure it's staying out of the hands of the patient. What, what happens next if that does occur? Um, I, I don't know for this, Dave Weiss for the record, it's an excellent question. For this particular scenario, 
we, the Board of Pharmacy, would hold the pharmacist responsible for contacting the patient and 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 communicating to them that they shouldn't have the prescription. This comes up already with, you know, the doctors prescribe something and it's and it's filled wrong or the patient or they wrote the wrong med. So there's a process where practitioners work together. That happens when the doctor, you know, selects the wrong patient and then they have to contact them. So I think they work together. Uh, you could always put more clarity in there that it's the responsibility of the pharmacist to, uh, you know, terminate that prescription. If, if the doctor says no, that could be clarity that you uh, add to the language. But I would, I would hold the pharmacist responsible because they made the professional decision to dispense. Okay, so they would be liable and they would also be responsible for getting the prescription back, but we would need some clarification because there is no process right now in the regs for the waivers that you issued. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Members, any other questions? Okay, seeing none, we can move into testimony in support. Um, again, I am going to start with those who signed up in for testimony in support, I believe I have Mr. Brian Wachter with the Retail Association of Nevada. Madam Chair, it's Liz McMiniman with the Retail. <laughs> Thank you. Please, when you're ready. Thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. And uh, thanking the sponsor for bringing this bill forward. This simply codifies in statute what is being done during the current pandemic. It has worked well. We haven't had any complaints and our members have not had any complaints and we haven't seen any issues that, with this at this time. And it's really important to understand that when uh, uh, the emergency first happened, we were right up against that with, with people who were panicked with not being able to get their medications that were for their, uh, to help in their medication management for their therapies. And so it was, uh, I thank the Board of Pharmacy and the governor for working together and making this happen for those patients out there in Nevada that needed it. And I think <clears throat> this bill is a good bill that has an opportunity to uh, protect the patients in, in, in our state. So I thank you again, and I thank you for the time to speak on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McMiniman. Okay, it looks like we also have a Sequilla and talk with the Human Services Network here to testify in support. Okay, broadcasting, can we check the telephone lines for any callers wishing to testify in support? Chair, uh, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you. Um, I do not have anyone signed up to testify in opposition on video. So can we check the telephone line for anybody wishing to testify in opposition? Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers for opposition at this time. Thank you. And I... Do you have someone who signed up to testify on video in neutral? Uh, Julia Peak um, with the Division of Public and Behavioral Health. Do I have Julia Peak? Hi, Chair. Thank you. We were just here to answer questions. Uh, my Medicaid partners are here, as are we for public health, but no specific comments unless there's questions for us. Thank you, Ms. Peak. Broadcasting, can we check the telephone line for those wishing to testify in neutral? Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers for neutral at this time. Thank you. Assembly Member Hardy, would you like to give any closing remarks? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee, for um, hearing this bill and for your uh, comments and questions. And I will definitely follow up and get the information and continue to work on this. Um, I think it's important, as was stated, um, when a situation like this arises and that we have been in for the last year. Um, people that rely on medications, you know, it's a scary thing. It can be quite um, nerve wracking and cause anxiety to think, I need this medication and how am I gonna get it? And so I think it's important for that. And it is, you know, as I said, 
it's for a limited circumstance. And um, I, you know, we wanted these people, especially seniors and those that have, you know, conditions that they rely on this medication, that they can have them the comfort of knowing that there is a way um, in state law that they can get the medications that they need. So again, I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Assembly Member Hardy. With that, I will close the hearing on Assembly Bill 178. Members, the last item on our agenda is public comment. And while we give those listening over the internet time to call in, I will go through some public comment housekeeping. I would like to remind those present that the period for public comment is an opportunity to discuss general matters that fall within the purview of the Commerce and Labor Committee. The public has already been given ample time to support or oppose legislation. And we open and close hearings on bills so that we establish a record of the public testimony on the bill. Therefore, public comment is not intended to continue a bill hearing. Your testimony during public comment may be limited to two minutes. Please address your remarks to the issues that fall within the jurisdiction of this committee. If you direct your remarks to issues over which this committee has no oversight, I will kindly ask you to redirect your remarks or terminate them. Be respectful of committee members and other witnesses. Do not comment on testimony provided by other speakers and do not make personal attacks. You may always submit written remarks for inclusion in the meeting record. With that um, broadcasting, is there anyone on the telephone line to testify in public comment? Chair, the public line is open and working. However, there are no callers at this time. Thank you, broadcasting. Members, our next meeting will be on Friday. Please be on the lookout for the agenda and the start time. We will be work sessioning on, our, on Friday. And with that, we are adjourned. That concludes our meeting for today. Thank you.